Coming up on DTNS, a big science project takes shape. Automation continues to shape the labor market. And how could a new U.S. digital regulator shape the future? This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, May 24th, 2021. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Also joining us today, Nate Langson. Hello, Nate. Welcome back. Thank you for having me once again. I'm returning like a annual common cold. <laughs> <laughs> but much more frequently, thank goodness. I don't know. Uh, no, it's great to have you. And uh, I heard the weather's been s s somewhat uh, non-balmy over in your neck of the woods lately. Yeah, it's lame. It's the only <laughs> thing I can say. It's lame. It sucks. Uh, yeah, besides besides weather, uh, which we always talk about before the show, we were also talking about fizzy water and soda and seltzer and soda water and what lemonade is in the UK and all sorts of stuff. If you want that wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet, you can get it by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Reuters reported it has seen or has seen a letter sent Friday from India's Information Technology Ministry to social media companies asking them to take down any content that refers to an Indian variant of the coronavirus. Coronavirus variant B1617 was first identified in India last year, but the ministry says the WHO has not associated the term Indian variant with the B1617 variant of the coronavirus in any of its reports. The smartphone maker Honor confirmed that its new Honor 50 series will come pre-installed with Google services running Honor's Magic UI on top of Android with a Snapdragon 778G chipset. Honor was spun off from Huawei last year and is therefore no longer impacted by U.S. sanctions that caused Google to revoke Huawei's Android license. All right, in global chip shortage not getting worse news, TSMC announced it will increase auto chip output by 60% in 2021, representing a 30% increase over the 2019 pre-pandemic levels. That's good. However, in global chip shortage potentially deepening news, Taiwan's Director General of Taipei's Cultural and Economic Office in New York warned that a sudden rise in community transmission of COVID-19 in Taiwan may further exacerbate the ongoing chip shortage. The country previously had zero reported cases of community transmission for the last eight months, and it now has over 700 reported since May 9th. About 1% of Taiwan's about this, yeah. population is vaccinated. The FBI issued a flash alert that the ransomware group behind an attack on the Irish healthcare system also targeted at least 16 healthcare and emergency networks in the U.S., including police and 911 dispatch centers. The threat actors used the Conti ransomware, attempting to both lock out and extort victims with potential data leaks. The FBI didn't identify specific victims or say if any organizations paid a ransom. And the Chinese short video platform Kaisho reported a net loss of 57.8 billion yuan, that's about 8.98 billion U.S. dollars, in Q1, up 89% on the year. That is the loss increase, even as, annual, uh, even as revenue increased 37% on the year to 17 billion yuan. A rival to ByteDance-owned Doyen, Kaisho saw slowing monthly active user growth as well, up 5% of the year to 520 million users, with advertising now surpassing tips and virtual gifts as its top source of revenue. All right, let's talk a little bit more about science. Big science. In fact, that's actually the name of the project. A group of more than 500 <laughs> researchers have signed on to the Big Science Project, an effort led by the startup Hugging Face which is just a great name, ah, just <laughs> props to you, to build an open source large language model to better understand natural language processing. This is taking an open science approach with a goal of sharing all resources with the greater scientific community. Now under the project, all researchers will focus for a year on answering how and when these LLMs should be developed and deployed to gain their benefits without known harmful consequences. The Big Science Project will look at things like the environmental cost of ever-increasing number of LLMs, how to responsibly source training data rather than just scraping the web, and developing multilinguality. The goal is not to create a commercial project, a product, rather, but create publicly documented research to understand all of the pieces of an LLM impact and its generated outcomes. This is really a fascinating project, and it kind of takes an interesting idea, almost like 
a like a software development sprint, but for scientific research. Uh, and this may be common. I I won't pretend to be super familiar with like scientific research, but this idea of hey. These are things that are becoming increasingly pervasive. We have uh, uh, things like GPT-3. We have Google just uh, announced their Lambda uh, LLM that they're going to kind of integrate across all of their services. And there's a lot of organizations that are really anxious to use these startups funding all sorts of efforts in this regard. And you know, with a, with a lot of these uh, you know kind of neural network or machine learning uh, kind of interfaces, a lot of it is for a lot of businesses, like a black box. You put stuff in, stuff comes out, and if it works, it gives you business value. Don't ask a lot of questions. It's really good to see, okay, that we have no commercial benefit to this, and we just need to figure out, uh, you know, come at this from many different angles, like the environmental cost. I've never heard that, you know, discussed in, in these kind of systems. Training data has kind of uh, been top of mind when a lot of these ethical AI discussions. So really uh, 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 an interesting model to kind of uh, provide a, a really great research corpus um, for these models as they continue to gain popularity. Yeah, and I think that the idea of things being open source and not necessarily being developed for a commercial purpose will help some of those unknown unknowns be figured out, particularly as we've seen a lot of examples in the past of AI. Let's say, um, we, well, we've certainly seen racist AI. We've certainly seen uh, an awful lot of uh, discriminatory AI based on the the models uh, that they're trained on. And I think that it's the kind of thing that the more people are able to share and build on each other's work, the more reliable these tools are going to be, which can only be a good thing. And it's the kind of thing that only works when it's open. So I'm I'm massively in favor of this. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, I think that large language models, LLMs, uh, you know, you figure, oh, okay, well, the more research, the better. And that's kind of what it sounds like the big science project is about, but in the sense of, okay, well, where are they being deployed, right? Uh, how, how big are they? Who then would like to use them? Something like multilinguality, for example, is, is, a, great, is a great example of, okay, well, let's say that there was a model and it worked well, um, but it was pretty fluent in like a single language. Now, is that going to influence how it is used and by whom it is used in the future? And can scientists work together to make sure it's as, as inclusive as possible and is able to reach as many scientists as possible? Yeah. And I, I wonder if this is re uh, not related, but I wonder if this is an impact. You know, we we had a story on uh, Daily Tech headlines about um, uh, Alphabet's DeepMind uh, had kind of been seeking greater autonomy, and those discussions had reportedly been shut down. And the, their kind of whole thing was, we want to take uh, a part of, we want to be able to do more things to kind of benefit the overall science community when it comes to AI research using more of a nonprofit kind of structure. It ends up, you know, not kind of working out. This seems to be maybe an answer to uh, to that, th address the same kind of concerns that I guess DeepMind reportedly had. Indeed. All right. Next up, uh, Facebook's vice president of global affairs and former UK deputy prime minister Nick Clegg wrote an op-ed for CNBC calling for US lawmakers to create a new digital regulator. Clegg says it could have over, uh, this regulator would have uh, oversight of content, data, and economic impact in the digital space, comparing it to the U.S. Federal Communications Commission's oversight of telecoms and broadcasters. So, an FCC for digital, essentially. Uh, Clegg also outlined four other areas for law makers to address. Not surprisingly, reforming Section 230 was included, kind of a, a common call that we've seen from a number of uh, platforms and stakeholders now. Clegg called on the continued protection from liability for platforms with robust capabilities for identifying and removing illegal content. Clegg also called for transparency, accountability, and oversight of any removal of content. He also called on Congress to create a strong deterrence against uh, something called influence operations, organizations that intentionally mislead or erode public trust. This includes transparencies for when these are discovered, but also mechanisms for lawful information sharing on these organizations and the ability to impose liability on the organizations carrying them out rather than the platforms, AKA potentially Facebook. Uh, third was also a call for federal privacy regulation. Clegg called this, uh, Clegg called in a sensible middle ground where some progress could be made despite maybe partisan uh, uh, rumblings on either side of the aisle. Uh, and fourth was a call for data portability standards to give consumers a better chance to vote with their feet on services rather than be locked in. That last one absolutely fascinates me because we're we're sitting here on the anniversary of GDPR, everybody's favorite uh, 
uh, internationally observed annoyance uh, that's that's had some good results in in some ways. Uh, but we're at the uh, I think maybe fourth year anniversary, maybe even five. Uh, but it's certainly a few years right this week, I believe. Um, and um, the data portability is one that I've always thought that's ripe for being used in a better way. Like if you can essentially say, well, this is all the information, all the profiling and everything that a business has about me that I've given over the years. If I have an ability to, to move that to one of their competitors, then maybe the competitor sees uh, my data as valuable that has an actual dollar or pound or whatever currency um, value attached to it, which could result in discounts or, you know, uh, promotions that you get by moving over. But we've not really seen any uh, any use of that because the the standards that are required are not implemented. And so a, a move like this would be brilliant if it works. I think we've seen over the last four years or so that there seems to be very, very little incentive for a business to want to implement this whether or not uh, this could be uh, essentially legislated uh, for in, in some way will be a very interesting one to watch, but I've not seen any evidence of there being appetite for that particular bit yet. I also thought the the idea of uh, deterring influence operations on platforms was interesting. The way that Clegg, if I understand this correctly, the way that Clegg is, is describing it is, okay, let's say there's an organization that is existing on a particular platform in order to mislead the public or to erode public trust. Okay, I can think of a few examples of things that I've seen that would fall into that category. But instead of, and let's say I read this on Twitter, instead of it being Twitter that uh, you know comes under fire for allowing this content to the organization that posted it, saying you knew better than to go to a social media platform and spread all this misinformation. And I know that does happen to some extent already, but to kind of bypass the platform as, you know, again, platform's just a tool. They didn't do anything kind of uh, that, that, uh, that would uh, create some interesting scenarios, I think. I, I think these play into a lot of what Facebook has been telling, uh, 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 at least in, in U.S. testimony, kind of its advantages in scale in that by being able to be this massively scalable operation, they they do have the the ability to uh, sort content, identify and remove illegal content, and they can show that they've removed however many millions or billions of posts uh, related to that, and then, you know, uh, and, and have the mechanisms to kind of audit regularly and the scale to do so. Um, and the same thing for these kind of influence operations. I think this is playing to Facebook's strength. We've seen a couple of security stories coming out where Facebook's helping to disrupt, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, hacking groups or, or groups that are uh, tied back, uh, believed to a state actor or something like that in advance. Persistent threat uh, is the is the lingo there. So a lot of these are already like Clegg's like, hey, we should have legislation that plays to a lot of the things that we're already really good at. Um, the the thing that kind of stands out to me in terms of the data portability, Facebook has made at least token passes on this in that they are part of the data portability project. They are increasingly letting you get some of your like personal media and stuff to transfer between services. Now that's different than just being able to click download and get like you know a, a big zip file or something like that. At, at least maybe content that doesn't have long term value for them. They'll let you get out of the platform. Uh, I will be interested. You know, there's a, Clegg was very uh, uh, wanted to talk about non, you know, like nonpartisan solutions. Let's let's find middle ground. Let's bring people both sides of the aisle together. He wants a regulator modeled off the U.S. FCC, which at times can has a history of being very very a very very partisan institution, depending on who's president at the time. So I do have to wonder how much that regulator could operate. You know, in a sensible middle ground. Uh, you know, and we'll, I, I, who knows if there is an appetite for adding more regulators uh, at the federal level at this point. Well, if you follow the automobile industry, and especially if you follow the EV automobile industry, you probably didn't miss the news last week that Ford had revealed a lot of uh, details about the F-150 Lightning electric pickup truck. Gotten a lot of press, gotten a lot of interest, and that includes the F-150 Lightning Pro. That's the version of the truck aimed at the commercial market. It can travel 230 miles on a single charge and starts at just under $40,000. That's for the standard package. Now we have more information on the Lightning Pro's extended range version. It's capable of about 300 miles on a single charge, has a 240 volt battery, 80 amp charger. It's called the Charge Station Pro. It can also fill the battery to 100% in eight hours. So, you know, if you have overnight, you're pretty much good to go. Price is just under $50,000. So you're bumping up about 10K for the extended range version. 
Again, this is for the commercial market. Now, Ted Canis, general manager of Ford's North America commercial business, says the average F-150 commercial customer in the U.S. right now drives less than 174 miles on the daily basis, and that's 95% of the time. So 95% of the time, you know, the average commercial customer is driving, you know, about, you know, just under half of what an extended range uh, Lightning Pro would afford. Ford would include an online tool as well for fleet managers and other commercial customers to factor in purchase and lease costs, federal and regional tax incentives, regional fuel and energy costs, all stuff that has to be factored in if a fleet is thinking about, you know, going electric or, or partially. The F-150 Lightning Pro is set to start deliveries next year with a smaller 12-inch version of its infotainment system running Sync 4. The consumer version has a nice 15-inch version, so, you know, it's 12 inches, still not tiny, but it's smaller. Also, vinyl seats that are durable, designed for harder wear. Anybody want one? <laughs> I do. I really want one. I do. I want the consumer F-150, and I don't even need a truck. It's crazy. I don't know what's come over me. I think I'm just, I'm feeding off of a lot of other people's energy. But the commercial aspect of this, I think, is really interesting. Ford saying, hey, we have crunched some numbers here. We have commercial customers. People do need these kinds of trucks. People are interested in going electric, at least, you know, in some capacity, if it makes sense for their bottom line. And we don't think that our range is going to be a problem most of the time for customers Customers who you know who need to depend on these vehicles for things other than you know kind of consumer commuting stuff. And this is where Ford differs from the other EV players on the market, who are like the Rivians, the Teslas, um, because Ford understands who their customers are and they understand who the target audience for this particular truck is. The 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 consumer version is targeted toward uh, people who need a truck on a, on a, the off chance, like I need to load a couch in the back, or I got to move my kids' bikes, or something else. Um, the 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 commercial version is designed for that kind of constant daily duty, not high mileage, but constant stop and go. We got to move shrubs. We got to move uh, men from one place to another. We got to carry the tools in the back. We're doing like construction work, and this is the thing. Fleet. I've I've always often said this. The key to the fastest EV adoption, at least in the United States or North America, is fleet sales. If you can sell enough EVs at one time to a particular purchaser, whether it's governmental or a large contractor or municip municipality, they oftentimes, when they buy cars, uh, like, for example, think of Hertz or, or a rental car company. When they buy a large fleet of cars, oftentimes on the lot, when, they, when you go to the airport, they have a gas pump there to load up the car right before to top off the car right before that goes out to a client you can do that now with electricity you don't need to dig an expensive holding tank that has to be epa checked to make sure it doesn't leak you uh you offload a lot of the complexities uh and you amortize the cost of the car and especially with electric cars as you heard from our roundtable ev roundtable the maintenance costs are less so for a large corporation if they crunch the numbers it could actually be an added benefit Plus, without the the need to find fuel, you just need to cook up a 240, 80-volt uh, uh, system on, on premises. You could eventually allow the public to use it for a fee, whether it's like the post office, got a bunch of EV trucks, we got a couple of charging EV stations. You want to use it, you pay like you know 50 bucks, you get a month pass or something. And I think that could slowly increase uh, adoption of EVs, but it would also help Ford because they'll be out on the front. I'll just say this is incredibly important. I mean, obviously, it's no no breaking news. This is an incredibly important vehicle for Ford to nail. I think they're it's very surprising to see these prices. I know like forty thousand dollars is a lot for me to spend on a car. For truck buyers, though, for a new truck, I, I, again as a starting price, that's not bad. The question I have though is so that uh, you know uh, that average of one hundred seventy four miles ninety five percent of the time. If you have that two hundred thirty mile truck and you're towing anything, I imagine that number goes down quite a bit maybe even with the 300 so that would be that would be my question is it's it's going to come down i think it, the first generation will sell on novelty and will sell on you know it's a good price uh people that like evs that like that instant torque that like that power very tempting it'll be that second generation where they'll be like hey you got that 
F-150 Lightning. What, what was what was it like when you took your camper out? I think, I mean, not from a fleet sale perspective, the Pro has its own levels of concern, but in terms of this being the number, it has to be the number one seller for Ford, right? This is their golden goose. In terms of those kind of sales, I think that would be incredibly important for that second generation too. And if you're wondering why I have nothing to say, it's because I have nothing of value to add to this. I don't <laughs> drive and I have no interest in cars. <laughs> but I, you look so great in F-150, Nate. I know it. Who yeah. wouldn't? Yeah, right? I know. Uh, yeah, trucks. What are you going to say? Hey, before we move on, if you want to expand your tech skills and your Spanish at the same time, well, you're in luck because Dan Compost is here to help. Hello, friends of DTNS. It is time for the word of the day, brought to you by Noticias de Tecnología Express. Ah, wearing or using something for the first time. You know that feeling, right? In Spanish, we have a verb for that action. Estrenar. It applies for more things than clothes and has a similar meaning to premiering something like a new film or launching new features in a platform or an app. If you use TikTok's new automatic caption, estás estrenando una nueva función. Also, you can say that when TikTok releases such option, TikTok estrenó una nueva función. You can learn this and more words by listening to Noticias de Tecnología Express, available every Friday. All right, well, with work disruptions caused by the pandemic, there are now 8.2 million fewer workers employed in the U.S. than there were a year ago. Uh, however, when we look at terms of productivity, uh, we're looking at goods and services, we're roughly the same as pre-pandemic levels, despite all of those uh, job losses. Some of this is representative of a trend that economists have kind of seen in deep recessions where output recovers faster than the labor market, but a big part comes down to automation. Economists are seeing that automation is letting companies fulfill orders they'd otherwise have to turn down due to inadequate labor, and this is only accelerating. Automation is expected to have long-term impacts from slower job growth to projected doubling of robots in the global economy by 2025. The World Economic Forum forecast last year that by 2025, automation would uh, create 97 million new jobs but eliminate 85 million, so there is a net uh, gain there, with jobs like office support, food service, production, and customer service the most vulnerable. That means that jobs will show up, uh, that jobs will show up to replace what is being lost, but there will be a lag. Though a lot of these trends have been forecast for a while, the pandemic forced a lot of industries and businesses into kickstarting automation initiatives. Um, you know, Nate, I'm sure you've seen uh, quite a, a, you know, a bit of this over the last year. Uh, you know, does does that kind of jive with what you've been, your experience? Yeah, I mean, we've got an unemployment an unemployment rate at the moment. I think around just under five percent. Uh, obviously, our country is uh, is smaller, is less populous, but um, but the the figures have been uh, have been quite shocking uh, in in a way. And I think that uh, every time I hear stories about um, people fearing because of auto you know fearing for their jobs because of the rise of automation my instinct is always to think back to the industrial revolution and the the luddites that would go around smashing up looms because they thought automated you know or machine based uh, textile industries were going to be destroyed because of looms and and we're going to put them out of work obviously we just then needed people to build looms and run the factories and um and repair looms and there's been many many cases uh, time and time again we see it with music piracy and the music industry thinking cassettes were going to kill them and then mp3s were going to kill them and it, it it always ends up being that humans in society tends to be pretty smart at adapting and uh, and staying relevant even in the face of something unexpected like automation and pandemics so um so i remain pretty confident but at the same time you know we're fortunate to be in employment and have jobs and um and, and i do sometimes think well maybe I should be speaking to more people who are unemployed and see if they agree with what I'm saying. So I don't know if that answers your question, but they're the, they're the emotions that rise whenever I hear about this topic. I do think it's it's always eye opening to me to hear from it's sort of that long term economic standpoint, right? It's it's historically uh, there are deep recession trends where output ends up recovering faster than a labor market. OK, that makes sense. You kind of go, OK, that that definitely makes sense. What we're going through right now is of course compounded because we've had this pandemic sort of, I don't know, it's a, a gap year of sorts, uh, a little bit more than that. So a lot of things were, were maybe they were, maybe they were on the table. Maybe they were ideas that, that were being floated around. Maybe a variety of companies, management, 
uh, team sessions were like, yeah, we got to get on that automation thing. And we're forced to a lot more quickly. So yes, when you see a ripple effect like that, that would perhaps be a ripple over a decade or more become something that sort of gets changed really quickly uh, because the people physically could not do the jobs that they were otherwise going to do otherwise, and you know, through no fault of their own, then yeah, it takes a while for things to shake out. And, you know, I know we talk about it all the time on the show, but it's like, if there are more jobs that are predicted to be created, the jobs that are lost, even though there are jobs lost and not all of those people can just, you know, flip a switch and go into a different role in, in a best case scenario, the the folks who were doing the older version of the job are now freed up to do jobs that are better suited to them, uh, you know, and make better better use of their skill set. And Beatmaster in the Discord was asking about how many musicians are making a living through music now compared to before. I think on, on the back of my comments about MP3s and cassettes, maybe. But you know, the, the entire landscape of of recorded music and that industry has has changed so enormously over that period that. There are more musicians, but there are also more ways for music to be distributed and consumed. And that means there's more piracy and ways to get around paying for things. But that opens up new opportunities like live streaming and things that you can only get if you pay and support a band directly. And so I kind of feel that, you know, like with what I was saying previously, that we we just as a as a culture, at least in uh, over the last few decades, we have this ability to just respond pretty quickly to whatever, uh, you know, the environment or the healthcare system or whatever it is throws at us. And I remain pretty confident that um, that we'll we'll be fine once again. But I, maybe I'm just the optimist and maybe I should be saying it's all doom and gloom. It's terrible. We should all go and, you know, yeah. you're the robots <laughs> come for you. Yeah. Uh, well, this perhaps isn't doom and gloom. Uh, Microsoft updated its Xbox Cloud gaming app for Android to add better support for the Surface Duo. Now, the mobile device will work like a giant Nintendo DS when held in the clamshell compose mode with the top display showing the game and the bottom showing a virtual version of an Xbox controller. There are currently more than 50 titles that support Xbox Touch controls. That's what it's called. Is the Surface Duo a failure, you might ask? Clickbait headlines. Wanna know? Microsoft cut the price from $1,500 to $1,000. That could ind indicate slow sales. It could also be the normal price cycle of an aging product. But the device is also getting an international launch later in 2021, with Microsoft continuing to update features. So it does not seem like it's dead and gone. Just the opposite. Yeah, this is, you know, Microsoft a lot of times plays a longer game uh, with their hardware. I mean, if you remember the original, you know, Surface tablets weren't exact, a lot of them weren't exactly uh, uh, super well received. I think they've built that into a respectable business. The fact that they keep adding features, and this is a big feature uh, uh, for this, I think that's it's an interesting use case. Obviously, if you're a hardcore gamer, um, a, you know, a, a you know, touchscreen Xbox controller isn't exactly the most precise interface, but it still allows you to play, uh, and you and you do you are able to take advantage of that second touch screen tells me that you know Microsoft is is not giving up on this form factor that they're you know the, maybe a, a surface duo sequel uh, might be on the way you know you you have that really high price you only get the super enthusiast to buy that first gen uh, then you release a, a, a product in the second gen that has all of these interesting features at you know seemingly maybe a little bit more affordable price smaller bezels all that kind of stuff. Uh, not an unusual product cycle for any company to go through. And Microsoft, again, doesn't need to bank on hardware, can take their time and kind of figure this out. Uh, so that's that's kind of what I'm reading into this. Uh, even at 1,000, I think I'm going to uh, probably pass on my Surface Duo for this gen. <laughs> well, uh, Twitch has many categories of streaming. If you're a streamer, <laughs> you, you have one to choose from. Well, you have many to choose from, but you choose one, but now you can choose another and it's called Pools, Hot Tubs and Beaches. Because after Twitch received pushback from some advertisers and some viewers over the trend of hot tubs, actual hot tubs and people sitting in them often wearing bathing suit attire or other, you know, scantily clad stuff, it started to pick up steam. It's a bit of a Twitch meme on the platform. And Twitch created the new category to let, let the streamers stream. Hey, if you want to be in a hot tub, all good. Here's the place that we're going to add this category to, and you can go nuts. 
and also let advertisers limit participation in those particular streams more easily. Everybody wins. After Twitch pulled advertising from some hot tub streamers without warning last week, and that's actually what was the big story. You know, a lot of streamers were like, what, what the heck? What did you do this for? It told The Verge that had been a mistake. And that, quote... Being found to be sexy by others is not against our rules, and Twitch will not take enforcement action against women or anyone on our service for their perceived attractiveness, end quote. You yep. know, when you when you go into writing uh, corporate communications as a career, I don't know if anyone thought that being found to be sexy by others is not against our rules would, you know, be something you'd have to put out in a press release, but... Uh, uh, that 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 happened at Twitch. Um, you know, obviously, hey, you want advertisers to be able to know the content they're they're putting their ads on. So, uh, uh, you know, Twitch responding to the memes and and what's hot, uh, including the hot tubs. So, makes a lot of sense for them. Yeah. If you have thoughts on this or anything that we talk about on this show, past shows, maybe something we might talk about on a future show, do send it our way because we love your feedback. The email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Shout out to patrons at our master and our grandmaster levels. Today, they include Paul Boyer, Kevin, and Paul Thiessen. Also, we've got a brand new boss, and we want to thank that boss named YT. YT just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you to our newest boss. Yes, yes. Thank you to all our bosses and to Nate Langson. Nate, thanks so much for being on the show. A blast as always. Uh, where can people find more of your great stuff if they're so inclined? If they are so inclined, <laughs> I have made, I do a show every week for Bloomberg. Um, and I did one uh, this week all about understanding lossless audio, but specifically how it works and why people should maybe care about it. Um, and the best way to find that and my podcast uh, text message is to go to twitter.com slash Nate Langson. All those links are there. And thank you very much for having me back once again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nate. We are live on this show Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Join us live if you can. We'd love to have you. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Tom is back tomorrow and will be joined by Peter Wells. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>